Okay, <clears throat> we have a few minutes here before we get started. And, uh, I'm happy to have um, try to answer some questions if you guys have any. Hi, Professor. So for for Brownian motion, I was reading um, a little bit into it, and I saw that the increments were normally distributed and independent. Is that always the case? Yeah, if this is not the case, then uh, I'll wait, wait five more minutes before we get started on the lecture.
Okay, guys. I can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So, um, time to get back on. Uh, so we did all exams and we did exam prep. Uh, I should say, overall, with the oral exams, I was I was quite quite pleased to see how uh, how you guys did. Um, um, there are many students that did really well. Uh, there were a couple of students in the middle and a couple of students at the bottom. Uh, I tried to talk to each individual uh, student about feedback, what could try to do better. Um, so the main purpose of the midterm was to give uh, students some feedback. And um, whereas on the final, this is, I have to assign a grade and, and uh, of course, the midterm counts in this, uh, but at the final, this is uh, also about feedback. But it's it's like the accumulation of uh, of the entire course. So for most of you, you're doing you're doing fine. I'm not worried about you guys. Uh, some of you uh, did there's some work ahead, and I'm I'm hoping um, I'm hoping to get this fixed over the the next weeks before for the end of the semester. I sent out an email about um, office hours, like so the office hours are a little bit uh, different going forward. Uh, they are Tuesday, uh, sorry, Thursday and Friday mornings. So there was an email, there are Zoom links and passcodes and all that good stuff. Um, and again, I am available uh, sometime before class. Um, uh, tonight there were no questions. Um, so if you have questions, this is also a chance for you to, to ask them. So we're changing gears. Uh, what is going to come now here after uh, after the midterm is we're going to be moving into um, continuous time finance. All right. So what this means is that we're going to be using we're going to be using uh, the second textbook, right? So the thicker one, the one that has number two on it, continuous time models. And uh, we already did quite a bit in this textbook here. We already did quite a bit in the first two uh, sections on uh, probability theory and conditional expectations. But starting tonight, we're gonna be, we're gonna be down here in chapter number three. And more specifically, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna start out here in chapter 3.3 and then move forward. And you will recognize some of the things that are in here, there are some of the things you won't recognize, but for example, something like the Marco property, um, you've already uh, seen and discussed um, something like a Marco property. We're going to start here in 3.3 .3 and then move down uh, throughout uh, the chapter. Okay, so so tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Brownian motion for the first time. And um, my bet is that this type of, uh, of a function, this is something that that you guys have not seen before. So this is quite a, a different object uh, to study, right? So, so a collection, a collection of random variables and it's denoted by B T and say T, uh, T is positive. So if you either write it like this, or you write it like bt, then you have t in, say, an interval of zero to infinity. Um, right, so this is a huge collection of random variables. Right? This is what before we had in discrete time. We would have like sn maybe a zero to this infinity. So now this is an uncountable collection of random variables. This collection, this is a, um, 
This is a Brownian motion. It's a Brownian motion if. And then there are going to be a number of properties that must that must hold. The first one is. Uh, the first one is the easiest one. This is just a normalization. We start out at zero. Yeah, so we're going to think about t here as time, and um, we're going to say that the rounding motion is zero at zero. Okay, so that that's one thing. Second part is that you're going to be random variables. So for any omega, the map that sends t, so t is between zero and infinity. This map that maps t into bt of omega, this is continuous. So you pick you pick any element in the sample space, and you look at a path of the Brownian motion. So this is a w a path of this Brownian motion. You're going to get a continuous function. And so what that means is that. Like you start with here, this is B0. And what you're going to get is a path that will look crazy like this. This here will be BT of omega, and I have T out here. So this is just another note. Um, as we shall see, one cannot even draw. A path of a Brownian motion. So one should really be careful much more than I am by looking at a picture like this. These objects, this object of a Brownian motion, this is something that is so crazy that I can't even make a path of it on a piece of paper. And we're going to see that later today. Why? Uh, why it's so? So one should really be a little bit liberal uh, when you look at a picture like this one. We should be, uh, we should be, we should not take this too seriously because this is not how a rounding motion uh, actually looks like. So one is clear, it starts at zero, two, it's a continuous path. And then these ones here are path properties. These are path properties. And so here we're going to get distributional properties. <clears throat> the distributional properties are like if I look at uh, an increment, so if I look at BT minus BS, BT minus BS, this is going to be normally distributed with mean zero and then variance t minus s for any t bigger than s, bigger than zero. So look at, I take two random variables in my collection up here. I look at them at two different time points and um, when I look at their difference, I'm gonna get a normally distributed random variable. I also wanna have, and this is the last property, that if I take a collection, so say zero, it's less than T zero, less than T one, less than T two, less than Tn, for any such sequence of points over here in my interval, I will have that the increments B T N minus B T N minus one is independent of B T N uh, minus one minus B T N minus two is independent all the way down to B T one minus B T zero. So if I have a collection of random variables, B T that satisfy properties one, two, three, and four, I will call that collection of random variables for a Brownian motion.
Can you explain the last property again? Yep. So when I'm looking at, right, so this here means, so, and as an example of two, so an example of uh, the last one, so that's four, I could say, what do I have here? I have, uh, I can pick any ones that I want. So I could, for example, pick, um, I could look at B, I could look at B0, B1, B2, all the way up to say BN. Right, and then probability number two says that if I look at B1 minus B0, then this is gonna be independent of B2 minus B1, it's gonna be independent all the way down to Bn minus Bn minus one. And so, so we're not saying, we're not saying uh, that B7 uh, is independent of B8. And in particular, this is not the case, this is not true. Um, because if we are, like you've got to be Gaussians. Like if I look at, if I look at uh, these increments, you are assumed to be Gaussians, right? So I have here that B7, this is going to be uh, normal with mean zero and variance seven, B8 going to be normal it means zero variance eight right this here comes from this comes from three and uh b zero is zero right so <clears throat> i'll take s here to be zero and then i'll just have seven and eight for t and so if i compute if i compute the covariance i'll compute b7 times b8 that's my covariance like that's not gonna if, if you are to be independent, this should be zero. But how would we compute it? Well, the way that we want to compute that is I can use I can use here that if I look at increments, I have independence. So I could write this here as say B7 times B8 minus B7. Now I get an increment. But of course, now the equality sign is not true, so I have to correct it, right? So I have to add here B7 squared. So now it's true. And <clears throat> so I can use linearity of expectations. So this will be B7 times B8 minus B7 plus the expectation of B7 squared. And in the first part, I now know that these two guys are independent. Here I'm using, here I'm using four. I'm using four. This would be the expectation of B7 times the expectation of B8 minus B7. And for the second part, I'll use that this has variance seven. But to the second moment, this is seven. And this part here, right, this part here, this is has mean zero, and this has mean zero, so I end up just with seven. Right, so that's not zero. So this implies that B7 is not independent B8. So the last part says that if I'm looking at these increments, I will have independence. But that does not mean that if I sample the process at two different uh, time points, I'll have that they are independent. I'll only have that the increments are. Professor, um, yeah. how did you split up the, at the last part? The one, yeah. How do you split that up into the product? Because I know that B7 is independent of B8 minus B7. That that was part of uh, that was that was just probably have here three and four. 
I, I thought it was that B B eight minus B seven is independent of B seven minus B six. No, I, I can choose whatever constants I want here. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I, nobody says I only have to go one now. So it's true here that. So it, so it is true that B six no B seven minus B six is also going to be independent of B eight minus B seven. This is this is true. But it's also true that B seven minus I don't know B four. That's also going to be independent. This is also true. But it's not true that B8 is independent of B8 minus B7. This is not true. Oh, it's just a subscript n minus one. Like Tn minus one could just be some other. Yes. yes. Yeah, I got confused because I thought the n minus one was the was the here, name, here, be These are arbitrary. You just have to obey the inequalities. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Some more questions? <laughs> so, um, so we have this definition here, and so one thing that is one thing that is not clear is that can we find does such BT uh, exist? Like, does this sequence not sequence? Does this collection of Brownian motion does it exist? And I mean. Given that this is in chapter three in our textbook, the answer is obviously going to be yes. Um, but this is not easy. This is hard. This is this is a uh, this is not easy. Um, and um, you need a uh, you need a complicated uh, space. Uh, omega, what is the word? So we're we're not going to be discussing how one get how how one gets this to work. Um, th this is difficult. If anybody is interested, of course, you're more than welcome to reach out and I'll be happy to guide you to the literature where you can find such things. Um, another thing, and this is going to come later, there is a, uh, there is a more elegant, there's a more elegant description. There's a more elegant description and um, this is called uh, Levis, uh, so that's the name we've seen before, uh, characterization of Brown in motion. And then uh, this uses, this uses martingales. Right, so there will be, we also need a filtration here, right? So the filtration that we're going to be working with so now I'm going to be denoted by FT instead of FN. And this is the sigma algebra that um, the Brownian motion generates up to time T. Right, so remember what this means. This means that if I look at BU less than X, this is an element inside FT for any uh, X and R for any u less than t. So it's a small sigma algebra that makes all these uh, random variables measurable. So Lewis characterization is about, um, this characterization is about using martingales to give a description of, um, of when a stochastic process is a Brownian motion. 
So maybe we should just dive into it. Uh, maybe we should just get some martingales up on the board. There are martingales galore. Uh, examples of martingales uh, related to ground in motion. Um, so we'll start out with by far the most important one. Uh, BT is a martingale. Brown in motion itself is a martingale. So let's try to do that one. Okay, so what's the definition in continuous time of a, of a martingale structure? Well, I pick two time points, T bigger than S. I need to compute conditional expectation of the biggest one given the smallest one. Okay. Now, how would I do it? Well, it's not very far away from what we just did a few pages back. I would do this as E, and I want to use independence. So I have BT here minus BS, and then plus a BS, and then given an FS. So you can see now we are very close to a situation that we encountered a number of times uh, before, the, before the midterm. We have two components here, BT minus BS, and that part is independent of FS by the way that uh, brown emotion was constructed. These increments are independent of the past and BS is measurable. So it's very much aligned with things that we have talked about many times before. So here we'll use independence. Here we'll use independence. That'll allow me to throw the conditioning part away. Right, so for this part here, here I use that BT minus BS is independent of FS and I'll use that BS is FS measurable. So then we move on. The next part I'll use is that BT minus BS. This is gonna be normally distributed mean zero and variance T minus S. In particular, the mean is zero, and I'll just get BS here. So that means that the conditional expectation of the rounding motion at a future time is just equal to the current value that it has. So it's a Martin here. Uh, why is the conditional for the FS but not FT? This part here? Uh, uh, the first, why is conditional for the FS? Well, you have to, to, to prove that something is a martingale, mm -hmm. you take the process at a later time, mm -hmm. right? And then you condition it at an earlier time. So if you want to check something as a martingale, I have to compute what this here is and prove that it's equal to just the rounding motion. In this oh, case. Okay. But in discrete time, in discrete time, we would sometimes do one time step, but we could always iterate this and do more time steps. So here there is no next time step, right? Because the infinite many points between T and S. So you need to take one that's later than the other condition to figure out what it is. You can also see from this argument and lots of you talked, told me how, how one could adjust something like this to check for um, like the Marco property. How would one Based upon this argument here, how would we change it to see that BT is a Markov process? Well, Where we need a function. Yeah, take a function. So let F go from R to R. Let's make sure that we don't get into trouble 
I'm going to say it's bounded and continuous. And then how would you give the argument? Well, you take, you slab F in here around that B, right? And then condition on FS. And then how would you proceed from here? Then you'll split the same way we did above. Yep. Very good. And take the average over the independent components to get a function G of BS, I think. See, you didn't know before you took the midterm that what you were doing was actually a lot more general. And it was exactly the same thing that you needed to do for rounding motion. And I would not be surprised if what we're doing here really has absolutely nothing to do with rounding motion. This argument we're doing here, this ought to be much more general than just for rounding motion. It worked in discrete time, now it works for rounding motion. It probably is gonna work for something else too. There must be a more general structure that will allow all this stuff here to work. And it is. That general structure that we are really using is called Livy processes. We're not gonna go there in this course. But if you ever wonder how far you can push this line of argument, you could push it up to what's called the view processes. That's where it ends. Okay, so now we do this, we take the independence of use, what, what is the lemma we use here? Independence lemma. Use the independence lemma, right? We take the average over the independent component. This is BT minus BS. We right? take the measurable, measurable part out. So let's call that something like an X. And then when we're done, we put x equal to bs, and this here was the independence lemma. But this here is going to be your f, no, not f, this would be your g of bs, right, where the g of x is this expectation of there. And in this particular case, when we're dealing with running motion, you can actually write out, uh, we can integrate here over the normal density if so desired. Okay, so this is also, this is also a Markov process. Any questions on this range? So we had a martingale, we had a Markov process, two key features of rounding motion. Let's try some more. Let's do another one. We are also very happy with changing uh, measure, but here we, can't, we cannot use BT to change measure because this is normally distributed. So if you want to think, if you want to change the measure, we need a ZT that's positive. And the easiest way to get that to happen is to, well, take an exponential. Maybe take a constant, maybe just take a constant if you want, BT. So is that gonna be, is that gonna be a martingale? Let's, let's pause, we know B, we know B is a martingale, right? And then the exponential, this is a convex function. What do we get when I compose a convex function with a martingale? Jensen's inequality. Yeah. What kind of a process do I get? Markov process. Yeah, but we're talking about martingales now, right? So we have sub super or martingale. If I take a convex function of a martingale, I get- Oh, you meant like that. Okay. I, I we have to we have to do it to, to see, right? Does anybody remember what we get when a convex function is applied to a martingale? I think it's super, I mean, sub. Yeah, so it's a sub martingale. So if we want this thing to be a martingale and I have a sub martingale, what do I need to do to it? Sub martingales have a tendency to increase. So what do I need to do to the thing to make it you need to subtract. Yeah. I think. Okay. So what do we subtract? I mean, this is purely for memorization. I think 
my, my minus one half times times t okay well the cool thing is that you're more than welcome to guess we just have to check it right so is this a martingale when well, we go go through the same motion as before you pick t bigger than s bigger than zero compute e c t given f s by the way ibrahim how could it be purely for memorization? Have you seen Brownian motion before? I have, and also because we did this, um, I think it was the Black Scholes model. It was it was the same structure, I, I believe. Ah, so you recognize in the structure? That's awesome, right? But we haven't in this class. We have not talked about Brownian motion, right? But because we have done examples that were resembling what we're doing now. We build up intuition that will allow us to come up with a qualified guess of what should go on here. And this right. is exactly what we needed to do. Awesome, very good, very good. So how do we proceed here? Well, we'll plug in, we can start by at least plugging in what the definition is. This was EBT minus one half T given FS. Okay, so any ideas on what we should do next? Um, maybe make it into E B T times E to the negative one half T. No, we want to split the B T. We want to split the B T. How do we want to split the B T? Um, in increments. Um, yeah. Minus B S minus B S plus, plus B S. And then we can take a Richards and put that thing outside. And so now we're in this situation again, I have something that's independent and I have something that is measurable. I'll pull out what's measurable. What is left is now independent. I'll just take the average. And I'll remember this minus one half T on here. Okay, so what do we have in here now? What is this guy? moment generating function I yeah. think. for the normal with mean zero and variance t minus s does anybody remember what it is e to something is e to the one half sigma yeah. squared t squared yeah. well in this case would be t minus s yes and so now we combine we have ebs here we have one half T minus S minus one half T. You combine the stuff, we get E to the BS minus one half S. And so you see Abraham, if, so your intuition was spot on, but maybe if it would have been a little bit off, like if you would have put like a third here, like minus one over three times T, then you yeah. would be at one over three here, one over three here, one over three here, and then you get down to here and it wouldn't net out so nicely. Right. right. And then you just backtrack all the way back up and change that one over three to one over two and then try again and see if it works and it works and you're done. So, so that's, that's great. That's great. Right, so we also, there was a question in the chat. Can T be equal to S in this case? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's okay. If, 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 um, if T is equal to S, then it becomes, if, if T and S are the same, then it's, it's simpler because in that case, the conditional expectation of CT given FT is just gonna give me CT, right? Because this is already measurable. In the first case, yeah, it's just when I put, I mean, when T is equal to S, it, the case is much simpler, right? Because then 
if I do the conditional expectation of BT given FT, it will just be BT. It is okay. You can put you can put greater than or equal to here, or strictly greater than. The the case where they're the same. This is that's easy. Okay, so it seems like we have a pretty good grip, grip on, on how to manipulate these symbols. Um, so maybe we should move into something where um, we're gonna be on uh, a lot more on chart territory. And it's really nice to see that you guys uh, can do this um, comfortably. Uh, I had this comment here. We shall see that you can't even draw, you can't make a picture of the rounding motion, right? So it's kind of interesting um like we would we, we, we're working with an object um that you really cannot visualize um, uh, and yet it exists right so so let's let's move into something that is perhaps more um I won't say newer, but it's something that we haven't talked about uh, before. Before we had talked about the Marco property, the Marco property, and we talked about Martingales. Let's talk about something that is um, that is newer. So there's something called variations. And this is not variance. And it's not, uh, this is a mathematical concept. And um, there are two types of variations that we're interested in. We are interested in the first order, first order variation, and second order. Second order is also very often called quadratic. <clears throat> okay, so let me try to write down what this stuff is. So we have a function, we take a function, uh, our function is we're thinking about time as the domain and then R as the codomain. And then we're thinking about, so we take these time points again, T0, T1, T2, um, so if I'm interested in the variation, what I'm going to be looking at is how if at Tn, uh, say Tn plus one minus if at Tn, I'm interested in how, how it oscillates. And so I'm going to be summing up its oscillations uh, over this interval, so this is from uh, maybe I'll go all the way up to say uh, Tn. So I'll run here from uh, zero to n minus one. And then what I'll do is I'll take the limit as um, uh, so what's the notation? The notation that the textbook uses is like a pi, and then these absolute values, of two lines. Right, so, so where, uh, say that this, this thing here, this is defined to be the max of the length of these intervals. This is the max over n of uh, t, n plus one minus tn. So what I'm looking at is I'm gridding it out and then I'm taking the limit as I grid out and I have smaller and smaller, smaller intervals. When this limit exists, I'm gonna call this for the first variation of f. When this exists. Uh, 
Right, so this concept here is probably new to, to many of you. And it's not something that you guys have come across in, it's simply not something you will come across in, in calculus courses. And the reason for it is, well, we'll see now. So, so, so here I have a, a general function. Okay, so for in our case, we can do this to be continuous. That's okay. We can also define variation, first and second variation of uh, discontinuous functions, but because our rounding motion uh, has continuous paths, we won't be needing these discontinuities. But what happens if, so say, say if is continuous on chain, continuously uh, differentiable. So it's now smoother. Um, say that it's continuously differentiable, right? So, so F prime exists uh, and is continuous. Right, that's, that's why it's continuously differentiable. If it's only differentiable, if prime, uh, then only it has a derivative, but you're not guaranteed that the derivative is continuous, right? So there are, there are functions out there that are differentiable, but they don't have a continuous derivative. So we're playing now the game uh, where you're gonna say that F is continuously differentiable. So people will often write that this is in C1. Instead of writing out all that, we just write that it's in C1. Then what is the first variation? So let's compute let's compute uh, F's uh, first variation. So I take a function, it's smooth in the sense that it has a derivative and the derivative is continuous. I want to know what is the first variation. Um, Okay, so I'm going to use the mean value theorem. The mean value uh, theorem it gives us, um, say, uh, T n star, such that if I'm looking at f's derivative at T n star. This is exactly this difference quotient. So this is f, f at tn plus one minus f at tn divided by tn plus one minus tn. All right, so what is it on the picture? This is my Tn, this is my Tn plus one. I have a function that is smooth. So, uh, should I make the picture? Uh, see that this is my function. Uh, so I have a value here, I have a value here. This difference over here, this is the slope of this straight line. Ah, almost. And so what does the mean value theorem say? Well, it says that you can find a point in here. There's a TN star somewhere in this interval. So it said when I compute the derivative of this function, it's gonna have exactly that slope. So this is gonna be somewhere down here. These two are supposed to be parallel. So are, are we trying to like multiply over by the TN plus one minus TN and then substitute into the expression for first variation? Yeah, we, that's the second, that's the next step. Right now we're just using the mean value theorem. 
the mean value theorem says that if I have a function like this, um, I can find a point so that that the slope uh, that the slope between the endpoints is exactly the same thing as the derivative of the function uh, at that given point. So I'm hoping you guys have seen the mean value theorem somewhere. And now what we do is we do, uh, do as Richard suggests. So then we can compute the first variation. So what we need to do is we need to take the limit as this uh, as this splitting, uh, this is called a partition as this mesh gets smaller, and we'll be summing. And then you'll have, <clears throat> so the first variation of F, it'll be, um, it'll be the absolute value, F prime TN star times Tn plus one minus Tn. And what, what is this limit here? And what's this Isn't limit? Isn't that the integral? That's the integral. How far out did we go when we went up to Tn? It's the integral of the absolute value of f prime of u du. Right, and this here is fine, right? Because uh, f prime is continuous uh, on this interval zero to tn. That's where we use that it's continuous and differentiable. This thing here is fine. And it's that integral. So this was the first variation of a continuously differentiable function. <laughs> yep. So the second variation. Second variation, quadratic, quadratic variation. So again, it's a function. Quadratic variation of a function, we can again say it's continuous, it doesn't matter. This is defined to be, um, this is defined with these brackets here. F and it's a very similar expression as what we had here. So again, going to be this limit as the mesh goes to zero, and we're going to be summing. And the difference is the difference is instead of having a one up here, when you're doing quadratic variation, you're going to put a square. So now you can also see if I want to put like the third variation and the fourth variation, what I get is I just increase the power over here. So if again, so, so if F is C1, right? So it's continuously differentiable. Well, so this is as before, what would we do is, um, Compute the uh, compute what we have here and see see what we get. So if I if I try to work out if I try to work out what I have here, this is f t n plus one minus f of t n squared. I'll use the mean value theorem one more time, and 
I'll get this as f prime at this t n star. And I'll have to put a square. And then I'll have the increment square. And so what I can do now is I can borrow one of these squares and take the maximum and get an upper bound. So here I'll put the norm of pi. And then all I'll be left with, what I'll be left with will be, and then I'll have a prime TN star, absolute value of square, and then just TN plus one minus TN. And so as before, this part here, this is gonna to converge to the integral of f prime of u squared to u. But this part here, this is gonna to converge to zero, right? When the, uh, the, when the mesh disappears. So all in all, this number here, this is, this is a number between zero and infinity because if prime is continuous, so if prime squared is also gonna be continuous, I integrate it over a, a finite interval, I'm gonna be, uh, be integral. So I'll have a finite number times something that goes to zero. That means that the periodic variation, this is equal to zero. So the, the first variation is, is the integral without the square. And the second variation is zero. Could you go over the inequality step again? Yes. So what I do is I have a square here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna borrow, I'm gonna borrow one term in the square and put that term outside and take the maximum difference between Tn plus one minus Tn, right? That maximum difference, that maximum difference is exactly this object here. That's the biggest difference I have. Oh, okay. Right, so that goes out here and it gives me the inequality and I just leave the rest in place. Right there, I have a square here that stays the same. I borrowed one of these guys, so now I just have this one. Oh, oh, all right, thank you. And so this part here is as before, except for the square, right? There's a square here. There was no square on the previous one, right? There's an absolute value on the previous one. Now there's a square. And then this part goes up front, take the maximum. And so as the maximum goes to zero, then this product here on the right-hand side, well, this will go to uh, zero times whatever that value is. So it's going to be zero. Um, professor, um, the, the mesh, right? Yeah. Um, how are we, because... I thought that like T n plus one minus T n, like, like how do you know if that, if what you're taking out is like the max of, oh, it's, it's less than, it's less than or equal to when you think the max, right? Okay, okay, I see. Right here. But here, what I'm using is a t, tn plus one is always bigger than tn. So I will just, I'll just write that this here is less than the max over tn plus one minus tn times, and so times this tn plus one minus tn. So you're taking max away. And this max here, this is the absolute value of pi times tn plus one minus tn. Is it always zero or is it like? No, when you take the limit, right? The query variation is defined as the limit as this mesh goes to zero. No, I mean like, is the, the f in the bracket always zero? Yeah, that's always zero when when the function is C1. Okay. Yeah, so smooth functions. So continuously, so this should be I, E, continuously 
differentiable functions. They have zero quadratic variation. And this might be one of the reasons why you have not come across this concept of first and second variation. Because you have often uh, worked with smooth functions in, uh, in other classes. I like the dark face. Okay. All right. Hi. Okay. okay. So, so you have smooth functions. You don't see you don't see quadratic variation. It's just zero. And here comes the round in motion. So here comes the round in motion. So for round in motion, it is different. So, so we're going to let BT be a Brownian motion. Then if you look at the correct variation of B up to some time T, I should probably say that here, right? So this is the correct variation up to time Tn is equal to zero. Right? It runs up to say Tn. So you can put a subs subscript there if you want to. Then this kind of variation here, <clears throat> when you get computed along a path, it has this property that is equal to T. So then the kind of variation is equal to T. Why is there a um, subscript T on the outside? You have to measure where, I mean, what is the interval you're looking at? Uh, we're, we're computing, we're computing like the, the time grid ends up here at Tn. So I should also probably put a T in here. You're computing the correct gradation up to some time point Tn. Oh, okay, it's like indicating how far you're going in time. Yeah, how far you're going. Same thing here with the first variation. You see, there's a TN sitting here. I could also put that TN down there. Okay, so so that this is this is an interesting. That's definitely something new, right? So. You know, also, there are some consequences here, right? So, so a consequence of this if I computed the first variation of Brown in motion up to time t, if I believe that I have finite quadratic variation, what would what would the first variation be? Well, if you have something that is smooth, the correct variation is going to be zero. So here I have something that has non-zero, like this here is not zero, right? So here. is it going to be infinity? Yes. And how do we see that? Well, if I look at the correct variation, the correct variation is, I'll be summing btn plus one minus btn with a square. I think that I can play the game. I can play the game from before, right? I can split this here up. I can take the max, I can split it up into two. I can take the maximum outside. So we take the max over n of say btn plus one minus btn. And I'll leave the other one in place.
So if, if this first variation here happened to be finite, then what I'll have here, this will converge to the first variation. This will converge to the first variation of Bt. And this maximum here, because B is continuous, this maximum here, this is gonna to converge to zero. So this is because Bt is continuous. So then, then we have it because now I'll have, if the first variation was finite, if the first variation was finite, then I'll get something here that's finite times something that goes to zero. That means that this thing on the left-hand side is gonna to go to zero, but it doesn't. This thing here apparently goes to T. Or TN if you wanna put N stuff in there. Put N stuff in there if you want to. So the argument is that if I have finite second variation, well, then the first variation is gonna be plus infinity. So this gives you an idea about, so I don't know. So, so, so it, it is very hard uh, to draw functions uh, of, uh, of infinite, of, of infinite first variation. Right, keep in mind, it cannot be differentiable anywhere because as soon as it's differentiable, we can use what we had before and uh, it gets to have a finite. If, if, as soon as it's continuously differentiable, um, you, you get finite first variation. So you have to be able to draw a function that is not continuously differentiable anywhere. And such functions, uh, very hard. I, I, I think we should scratch this thing out here and say impossible. Okay, so the, the goal now is to do the top part here, right? How do we? How do we get this, um, how do we get that result? How do we prove that? So this, this is, yeah. Try, so, so we, <clears throat> to, to see that, to see that, um, this quadratic variation of Brownian motion up to time uh, t is equal to t. This is uh, this is not easy, um, but um, but we can show something related. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the textbook calls it q pi. And it takes it takes this object here, sum of the um, uh, increment squared, and then what it shows is um, what it shows. Uh, what the textbook shows is that if I look at Qt, and this is going to be a random Q pi, so this is going to be a random variable. If I <clears throat> if I subtract away, um, I subtract away t uh, tn, and I square it, and I take the expectation that this thing goes to zero as the mesh goes to zero. So, so this we can this we can show and, and so to see that we're going to start out by just getting a feeling for it maybe we should just compute the expectation of it 
queue. And the, word, the letter Q is used because of quadratic. Um, so how would one go about doing that? You will pull the sum outside and then take the expectation of these increments squared. But you all normally distribute it with mean zero and variance equal to the time length. So here we'll have Tn plus one minus Tn. And this is a telescoping sum. I'll end up here with Tn. So the mean of Q is exactly Tn. So what I have here on the left-hand side, this is nothing else than the variance of uh, QT. Of Q pi. Right, because what I'm subtracting here, this is exactly the mean. <clears throat> how, how did you go from uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the first sum to the second one, yeah. This one here? Yeah. Well, what's the distribution of uh, BT? What is the distribution of BTN plus one minus BTN? Wasn't it, um, oh, okay, I see. Because it was normal zero with var variance TN minus, okay. And then and then because the, the mean is zero, the other part drops out. Yes. You. And, and why is the, the sum over all of, oh, it's telescoping sum. The telescope, right? Yeah, okay. This nice. is the last minus the first. I think the first one, we've just put it to be zero. Okay, so can we prove, can we prove this? <clears throat> Give it a shot. Uh, let's have a look. So I'm looking at the variance, looking here at the variance of this object here. Okay, so it's a variance of a sum of random variables and these random variables, they are all independent, All right? So the sum, the variance of a sum of independent random variables is just equal to the sum of the variances. Okay, so let's compute what the variance of each element inside that sum is. So let's look at the variance of BTN plus one minus BTN and put a square there. Okay. So what is that? That's equal to the expectation squared so I'm going to get a fourth moment out of a normal. And then minus the expectation squared. That was what we just had before. So this is Tn plus one minus Tn, everything squared. Can anybody remember the fourth moment of a normal? Three. Three times. Uh, eh. <laughs> Three times the variance squared. Yes. I do have one of them over here too. Don't worry if you can't remember that, it's not a big deal. Anyway, here I got three, and here I have one, so I net them out. I get down to two. So I can now compute the variance of my uh, Q.
And this is going to be the, as we said, because we have independence, this is going to be the sum of the individual variances, which we just computed. So that's the increment squared. This is what we had here. So there's my two out there. And then I get my Tn plus one minus Tn squared. And I can use the same trick as before. This is less than two times. And then I take the max out and I'm left with this telescoping sum Tn plus one minus Tn. And this is the telescoping sum. I get that this is two, the max, and then here we get Tn, right? And this goes to zero as the mesh goes to zero. So we're not really showing, we're not showing the claim here. We are showing something that is related. Uh, showing this claim, this is, we're not, we're not ready for that, but we, we can do this, what we have here. And this, <coughs> so there, are, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, implications that are not trivial. So there are, there are, there are non-trivial uh, consequences uh, of this um, uh, first variation of Bt uh, being plus infinity and uh, the correct variation uh, being finite. And so by far, uh, by far the most important thing that we're going to be doing uh, by far the most important tool that we're going to be developing is Ito's lemma. And, and what you have seen is if, if I want to compute the derivative of F composed with G, that this is a formula that everybody has seen many times. Like you compute the F prime, compose it with G times G prime of X. This formula here, this is something that, um, you have seen a million times, and this is not true for Brownian motion. There is no this formula here. This is not this is not correct, and it's a consequence of this first variation, correct variation uh, calculations that that we have that we have dealt with before. This is not the right formula. And what you need is a much bigger gun. What you need here is uh, Ito's lemma. This is what is needed. I think this here is a uh, is a good place to stop. Uh, I know that there are. Uh, much more important things going on uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, I think I think this might be a good good place to stop. Are there any questions before before we call the quiz? Yeah, this one. Um, uh, when we did the variance on the thing uh, on this. Yep. The variance of. Uh, BTM, uh, the BTN plus one minus BTN squared. Yes. Uh, the second one after the fourth moment, that was, um, was that the expectation of this squared and then the square on the outside? Yes. Right, because the, the variance is equal to, you square the random variable and compute the expectation, right? So the random variable is what's between my fingers. You square them. You're going to get what you have here and compute that expectation. And then you subtract away the mean of this random variable. 
squared. Right, and the mean of this thing here is exactly what you had here, and then you have the squared. I'm just I'm just using here that the variance of x is equal to the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x squared. So it's simplified to the expectation of x squared, and then we squared out again. Yeah, well, here the square is inside, and here's outside. Right. I mean, like when we did the, because you get the expectation of b t m plus one minus b t n square on inside, and there's big square on the outside for the no, second. No, 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 no. My x. This here's my x. Right. No. For I mean, I meant for the second term, after that one. Like if you if you roll out the. Yeah, that as the expectation. Yeah, this part here, this here is equal to the expectation of bt n plus one minus btn squared. Okay, yeah. Right, that you, I think you were even the one that told me that this is how we get down to this one. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making sure because yeah. sometimes it gets a little confusing. Yeah, uh, I agree. But there was a question in the log. Uh, can you explain how you got the, um, how did I get the three? Well, one of you guys that knew how to compute the third, the fourth moment of a normal. Okay, so, so this here. Oh, you yeah. Take the derivative of the moment generating function. For example, the fourth moment uh, of a normal. Yeah, so how would you compute e of x to the power of four if x is normal with mean zero and variance sigma squared? I think you guys can figure this out. So you can do what Richard says, you can compute, compute derivatives of the uh, moment generating function, MTF, or you can use the density. Can you come back to the first part of the quadratic variation? Yeah. Okay, that one. Yes. Uh, all right. Mm. I, I want to ask like the part where you said it go down to zero. This one. Yes. Yeah, so what happens is <clears throat> you split up, you split up the last part. Yes. And you take the the pi outside. So you trade one of the two, you trade one of these terms with the pi. You get something that's bigger. And then what what you have left is is this object here between my fingers, and that thing converges as before to the Riemann integral. Okay. Which is finite, right? Because f prime is continuous, so we have something that's continuous on this closed bounded interval. <coughs> You're going to be integrable. And uh, this one here, uh, that one goes to zero. I should have something finite times something that goes to zero. Uh, the product is going to go to zero. Oh. Um... So the that pi thing is just defined to be go to zero. Are we we are taking the limit of that? Yes. Okay. So okay. it's it's the same with the consequent that comes after that, right? Yes. Yeah, we we always when you're computing these limits, uh, you you're taking a finite, finite, finite mesh. Okay. Yeah. So here 
when you have a continuous function, you're looking at how the continuous function over a finite and finite mesh, uh, what is the difference? Well, this, con this quantity here is going to go to zero. Okay, I see. The problem is over here that it's true that individually these terms here, they will go to zero. But you're summing up too, right? So you're summing up a lot more terms that individually go to zero. So I'm summing up a lot of small terms in a big sum. Right? That can go to either something finite or infinite. Okay. And if it goes to something that is finite and the term that you multiply on to goes to zero, well, then the product is going to go to zero. But if it, as in the case with Brownian motion, then this term here is going to go to plus infinity. And it's true that this thing here goes to zero. So then I'll have something that goes to zero times something that goes to plus infinity. And that product can go to anything. And this is exactly what has to happen, right? Because on the left-hand side, this thing goes to Tn. This thing here goes to plus infinity. This thing here goes to zero. So that limit, it can very well be not zero. And indeed that is the case here because it's, it's gonna be bigger than Tn. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, it's, we, we, we're playing this game that, we're playing this game, like if I have the limit as, I wanna send X to zero, say, we're playing this game that if I take X times one over X, this is always equal to one, right? And x here is going to go to zero, and this one here is going to go to plus infinity. So just because that goes to zero, if this thing here can go to plus infinity, I can say nothing about the product, right? It it can go to whatever you want it to go to, and here it goes to one. Okay. Are there other questions or comments? More questions or comments, or is it time to say goodnight? All right, have a good night, guys, and uh, thank you. Sir. Have a, thank you. Uh, stay safe tonight, guys. Okay, uh, no matter what you do, stay safe out there, and um, I'll see you guys on Thursday.